Okay, for networking in Linux, there are four things that you need. Let me make my text bigger. Linux networking. Somebody want to take a stab at the four things you need? IP address is going to be the first one, and I'll describe each one of these a little bit. An IP address. What? Subnet mask. There you go, DNS. Swerver. Now the DNS server you don't absolutely have to have, but it's a whole lot easier to type in www.yahoo.com than it is to type in 152.98.31.72 or try to remember all the IP addresses. So let's talk a little bit about what each one of these is. Your IP address. Who wants to give me a stab at a definition for an IP address? Yeah, it's an address, basically. It is something that identifies you particularly. I hate to just define it as address, but that's, that's a pretty good definition. It's an address. Um, IP, of course, is Internet Protocol. So it's a protocol where your address, what format's it going to be in? You got four bytes. I don't like the term octet. It's a byte. It's one, each one of them is eight bits. So how many, what's the highest number you can have in a byte? Bang, bang. I'm going to stop and pound my head for a little bit. The highest number you can have in one byte is 255. There you go, a full byte. Um, so the highest number you can have in any one of these is 255. Um, there was some movie, what was it, The Net, where Sandra Bullock was typing in an IP address and she had like 384.72.950 and all the geeks were going, eh, that doesn't make sense. So uh, anyway, an IP address is four bytes. So that, that just means that none of these can be higher than 255. Um, can anybody else have your IP address? Yeah, that's kind of yeah, that's kind of a loaded question. Um, we have private IP addressing. We'll branch out and talk about that for just a second. Make it big enough to see. Have public IP addresses, and we have private IP addresses. The idea is, if you holler Stephen. I'm going to be the only one in the room to respond because I'm the only one locally that's named Stephen. But if you were in an, a, uh, like at the Super Bowl and you had thousands of people and you hollered, Stephen, you know, there could be thousands of people respond. So on the Internet, um, if you're actually out on the Internet, there are public IP addresses. None of those two can match. Okay. Generally, no two things can have the same IP address. But we have private IP addressing. Now, your private IP ranges are going to be something like 10 dot something dot something dot something. Anything that starts off 10 is a private IP address. So if you're talking to your buddy in California and you say, oh, um, FTP to my, my server, my address is 10.1.1.1, it's not going to work because these private IP addresses are going to be translated through network address translation at your router into a public address. Um, what are my other ranges? 192.168, 172 172.16 uh, through 172.31. So those IP addresses right there, those ranges, are going to be blocked by your ISP. Um, you can use them locally, like if we had routers here on the network, you could do whatever you wanted to with them, but normally 
your home network. I bet most of you who have a router at home, y'all are probably on the 192.168.0 network or the .1 network. And the way this works out, and it's the same way here, you'll have a router someplace. Now a router is a device that joins together and separates networks. So let's say there's the internet. And then back here is your network. That looks good. Network. That's either a small network, my four or five machines at home, or it could be a huge network, like the AB Tech campus, where we've got a couple of thousand computers. Either way, back here is going to have one of these ranges. Ooh, that was neat, wasn't it? Oh no! It's going to have that range back here. But then when it gets to this point right here, it's going to translate into a real IP address. Something that's going to be like 152.94.91.4. This IP address is a public IP address and there can't be another one match it. Now on this side, if you have a server that is 10.1.1.2, you can't have another 10.1.1.2 anywhere on the network. But that's on this side of the router. So actually, most schools, universities, companies, depending on how big they are, there are probably thousands of devices out there that are 10.1.1.1, but they're all separated by routers so they don't see each other. But once you get out onto the internet, those don't duplicate each other. If they do, you got problems. If you have two things with the same IP address, things get confused and you don't know who goes to what. That's like two people having the same social security number. It it's, doesn't work. Okay. Um, subnet mask. Yeah, it tells you how big your network is. Um, it has to be there. Let me get me some text here. 255.255.255.0. That would be a common subnet mask. What does 255 look like in binary? Yeah. One 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 one. If you add one plus two plus four plus eight plus sixteen plus thirty two plus sixty four plus one twenty eight, if you add all those together, what do you know? You get two hundred fifty five. Okay. So what the subnet mask means, and I'm going to hit this really briefly. If you want to learn more about this and how to do it right, take net one twenty five. That's what we do in in the Cisco classes. That's where you begin. The subnet mask tells you what parts are your network and what part is the hosts on the network. So if I have, let's draw some more, boom, boom, a computer and another computer and a third computer and I've got them attached with a switch. And they're all connected together. If this guy is 192.168.1.1 and the subnet mask for all of these is 255.255.255.0 and this guy is 192.168.1.2 which ones can talk to each other? Yeah, this one can talk to this one, but can this one talk to any of them? No. The thing is, see, the ones represent the network. So this is all ones all the way up to this point right here. Your subnet mask is going to be all ones to some point and then switch over to zeros. And it's not going to switch back to zeros or back to ones. So what it's saying is the first three bytes of this have to be the same in order for you to communicate. So if it's 192.168.1 here, 
it's going to have to be 192.168.1 here. And this one can't talk because it's 192.168.2. When you try to send something to that, it's going to say, no, I can't talk to that. That's on a separate network. So that's how you separate your networks. Now, I'm not going to go too far into this, but let's do it again. Two fifty five dot two fifty five dot two fifty five dot one twenty eight. What does one twenty eight look like in binary? It's a one and then seven zeros, so we've not violated what we were saying. It still goes to ones and then switches over to zeros. So machines one ninety two one sixty eight dot one dot Four, one ninety two dot one sixty eight dot one dot five, one ninety two dot one sixty eight dot one dot two hundred. Can they all talk to each other? Why not? Yeah, the if we look at this last byte right here. Um. Real quick, I'll draw it out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. A five is simply one, zero, one. And a four is one, zero, zero. The trick is we're looking at this first byte right here. Because in the mask, this is a one, zero, 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 zero. See that? Is means that that first bit is in the network position, so they all have to be the same. Two hundred is can I do this? One two three four. One two three four. Two hundred is oh yeah, I can. One hundred and ninety-two plus one two four eight. I chose a number that was over one twenty-eight specifically for it. Notice this bit right here is a one, so they don't match. So this guy can't talk. Okay, that may have just gone shroom, over your head. If it did and you want to learn more about it, take the 125 class. What I'm wanting to show you is the subnet mask determines which networks you can talk to and which networks you can't talk to. It, it determines the size of your network. You can push this down to 255, 255, 255, dot 252. Cisco people, how many um, hosts does that give you? Two. You have two computers that can talk to each other. Those, that's usually for serial links. So it shrinks or it busts up your subnets. All right, so anyway, the subnet mask has a point. It determines the size of your network. Your default gateway. A default gateway is an IP address. Usually it's a router. It can be a computer sometimes. So let's take a look at it. Bonk. Default gateway. Let's say that we have what's called a stub network lot of them out there. Let's say you're a small company here in Asheville and you've got 25, 30 users on a network. And since it's local, we're just going to use the 192.168.5.0 network with a 24-bit mask. There's something new. 24 bits means 255.255.255.255. .255 .255 .255 came from, we said that your subnet mask is all ones and switches over to zeros, right? I got three bytes worth of ones, and there are eight ones in a byte. So three times eight is 24. That's why you call that a 24-bit subnet mask, okay? The router separates networks. That's its job. So that if dot five dot 2 is over here talking to dot 5 dot 4 
they can talk to each other, they can broadcast, they can work all day long, and when the router sees a packet going to dot five dot two or to dot five dot one hundred or dot five dot whatever, it applies the subnet mask and says, Oh, that's local, I'm not sending it out. Anything that's local, it's just gonna keep it local and not let it get out onto the internet. But let's say that five dot two wants to go to yahoo.com and it puts in an address of two oh nine dot two oh nine dot two oh nine dot one got tired of writing 209s. Um, when it sees that, the router is going to, well actually the machine itself is going to look at that address and it's going to say, I'm on the 192.168.5 network. That's, when I look at the network portion of the subnet mask of this address and what my address is, that's, that's not anybody I know. So what am I going to do with it? It's going to send it to the default gateway. That's your default gateway. Usually it is the, the, the interface closest to you on a router. So when it says, I don't know what to do with this, tell you what, I'm just going to send it to this IP address right here and let that guy deal with it. Kind of like if you work in a company and you want to ship something. You might be lucky enough just to take it in its box and take it to your default gateway out of the company, which is your shipping guy, and say, there you go, I need that to go to wherever, kind of like your IP address. I need that to go to 209, 209, 209. You figure out the best deal on how to get it there. It's just turning the job over to somebody else. Now, the default gateway, what if my default gateway, if I'm going to set it, I set my default gateway to 192.168.99.1. How about that? Somebody throw something at me. What's wrong? Why won't it work, Philip? My default gateway is on a different network. That's too late to throw something at me, and plus you have to have the right answer. All right. 99. The 99 is going to be on a different network. So your default gateway has to be something that you can ping directly, something that you can talk to directly. It doesn't do me any good. Um, for my shipping guy to be at some other company, if I need to ship something, I can't go down to Dave Steele and say, ship that for me. That doesn't fly normally. So we need to fix that and make that a dot five. Now, I got a packet going to yahoo.com. It puts this on the destination of the packet, sends it to this guy, and he gets it and he figures out how to send it out on the internet. What if you don't have a default gateway? Destination host unreachable is usually what you get. Can 5.2 two and 5.4 talk together without a default gateway? Yeah, they can. But that's all they're going to be talking to is just each other. All right, any questions on default gateway? Default gateway is just the way out. All right. That's one thing that we do a lot of, and we've probably already done it in here, is we get an IP address in the VM VMware, and the default gateway is something that it's not going to change. The interface on that router, hopefully, is not going to change. It can't change. Your people will be looking for it all the time. So if you can ping your default gateway, you can say, okay, I've got TCP IP set up right and I'm ready to go. I know that I can send stuff out. Last thing, see, we could have a usable network at this point, as long as you were willing to remember every IP address that you ever wanted to use, which is not terribly handy. What's DNS stand for? Domain name service, yeah. Service, system, Stephen, something. The DNS server um, is usually going to be, I'll go back to typing, IP addresses of servers. You've got servers, hopefully locally, if not maybe Bell South, you might use theirs or Charter, somebody like that, and hopefully you've got more than one. 
does a DNS server do? Okay, if I type in www.cnn.com, some, somebody, somewhere, some device is going to have to take that cnn.com and translate that into an IP address. Kind of like my telephone. If I go through clicking and I, I find Philip's number, something is going to have to translate the name Philip into a phone number or it's not going to get anywhere. Your DNS, how important is DNS to a Windows network? Very important. If you're working on a, a, a server, Active Directory won't even install without DNS. It gets to the point that it says, install DNS or just tell me where your DNS is. But one way or another, we're going to have to get this fixed now or installation can't continue. So DNS servers are important. So let's see if we can draw it in over here. The DNS server, if you're at home, and let's say this is your home network, probably don't have a DNS server at the house. Probably what you've got is a DNS um, probably sitting at Bell South or Charter, like I was saying. Now, could you have a DNS server of 204.204.1.1 in this situation? Yeah, your DNS server can be on a different network. Once we got our default gateway, we can get to it. And then you can say, hey, DNS server, um, give me CNN's IP address. Let's look at some of this stuff in Windows. If you say, IP config. It gives you most of that right off the bat. It gives me my IP address. It gives me my default mask, my subnet mask, and my default gateway. So there's three of my pieces of information just right off the bat. It also tells me what network I'm on. So I know I should be able to ping 192.168.254.1. So if I say ping 192.168.254.1. What's a ping? Every once in a while I have a Navy guy in here. Yeah, it's kind of, you, surely you've seen submarine movies where they'll send one ping and it goes ping and it's real loud and it pings to the ocean and it can tell what's around it by what's bouncing back. Well, I just sent a message, tiny little message to 254.1 saying, are you there? And it replied and it came right back and said, yeah, it took me less than a millisecond to get there. So I've got a good connection to it which makes sense. Um, what's ping stand for? Packet Internet Groper. How do you like that for a term? Groping. I am groping through the network. But that's the idea. It's mainly just to, to see what's out there and how long it takes to get there. Now some places will um, turn off pings, like the North Carolina Community College um, Network. Well, we moved on to another network, but for years we couldn't do ping www.cnn.com. CNN may have it turned off. Yeah. How about Google? I can ping google.com. It's kind of slow. Took 11 milliseconds to get there. That, oh. Okay. It lost one for some reason. But anyway, do what? Yeah. Yeah, we consider we had less than one millisecond and 11 milliseconds to get to Google. But pinging could be um, part of a security problem, you know, if they if you're not even responding. That's kind of maybe helping you stay hit a little bit. Anyway, let's do IP config slash all. I hate to show you so much Windows stuff, but I guess I should. If you do a dash all, here's my connection down here that we're talking about. No, it didn't. Which one am I looking at? Was that it? All right, 254.175. Yeah, that's my IP address, my subnet mask, my default gateway. I have a DHCP server. That's what we're going to talk about next. And I have a DNS server. Now, normally, you should have more than one DNS server, just in the event that your primary DNS goes down for some reason. A lot of times you'll have them in different buildings. So sometimes you'll see like 192.168.254.10 and then you'll see 254.11 
which usually means there are two machines on the local network that are backing each other up. In case one goes down, you've got the other. And then a third listing would be something like 204, 204, 91, 91, which would be on some other network in case both of your servers go down. But just so that you've got DNS, you usually put a good bit of redundancy in there. All right, so there's where the four pieces of information are found on a Windows network. The last thing I wanted to talk about, I gotta stop writing so much you can't read it. DHCP, dynamic host configuration protocol DHCP here's the story we'll use the example of a home network again there's your little router sitting at the house you bought it Best Buy and then back here is your local network with we'll say three or four machines on it this would work just the same as if you had a small company you, ha you need to have, uh, there's two different ways to set an address. Let me start there. You can either set a, an address statically where you go into the machine and you say, here's your IP address, here's your subnet mask, here's your default gateway, and here's your DNS servers. Now, that's cool for something that never changes. Um, that printer back there, file servers, routers, um, devices that, that really can't move because stuff's going to be looking for it. Those you would give static addresses to. Um, then you have DHCP where this machine you turn it on and when it boots up it notices that in its configuration it's set up for DHCP so it broadcasts out of discover networking people remember Dora discover offer request acknowledge it's going to broadcast out a discover to try to discover a DHCP server out there someplace. And the DHCP server, small home network, probably is going to be this router because they're real easy to set up. It doesn't add a whole lot to a network. If you're on a big network, you may have a computer out there that's actually setting up your, DN your DHCP. Either way, something, some DHCP server is going to say, oh, somebody's wanting something. And it's going to take that request and it's going to offer a configuration. Here, I'm going to put it on my router. It's going to offer, this guy is going to request and say, yeah, that, that offer sounds pretty good. I'm going to request that you make that reservation for me or that lease. IP addresses are leased. You've got a lease time. Finally, the DHCP server is going to acknowledge it and say, okay, I'm writing you down. This MAC address is going to this IP address, so this IP address is yours for the duration of the lease. Okay, so that's DHCP. What is the DHCP going to be handing it? Mainly those four pieces of information, IP address, subnet mask, default gateway, and DNS servers. There's actually several dozen things that it can hand out. Um, these hand out the name of your network. Um, it can actually hand out lots of different stuff. If you're on a, like a, an IP phone system, it can hand out the address of a TFTP server for your telephone to go out and download its configuration. So you can do lots of cool stuff. But anyway, we just want to get the basics of a DHCP server. Any questions on those? All right. So, how does all this get set up in Linux? Well, we can start off with the if config command. And what it shows me is that I have an IP address of 192.168.254.170. And that's easy enough. Let's see if I can ping my default gateway, which I just happen to know is 254.1. What do you know? I got lucky. Okay. To set an IP address just outright, you can say ifconfig 
my interface name is ETH0 and that's generally what it's going to be if you've just got one interface on a on a Linux box sometimes you'll get something goofy and it'll pop up to ETH1 or ETH2 but usually one and two are if you have multiple networks or multiple cards in a multi-homed computer I have config ETH0 192.168.250 I'm going to say 255.100 with a net mask of 255, 255, 254.0. Now that 254 right there allows me to use either a 254 or 255 right there and still be on the same network. All right. So now if I say ifconfig I'm 255.100. I'll uh, make it big here. Boop. I have config ETH0 that is a 23-bit subnet mask. But there's your command. I have config your interface, your IP address, the word netmask, and then your mask. All right. So now, ping one nine two one sixty eight two fifty four one. So yeah, I can ping it. All right. How about if I say dot one dot one hundred and one ninety two dot one sixty eight dot one dot one hundred can I ping one ninety two one sixty eight two fifty four one no because it's on a different network network is unreachable so you just immediately it knows that ain't anywhere that I am so network is unreachable um, in Linux, specifically Red Hat Linux, you can see I've got this screwed up, right? So to fix it back to the way that its original configuration is supposed to be, I can say service network restart. And that's a command that you wind up having to learn pretty much the first day normally. Service network restart. It shuts down ETH0, brings back ETH0 it went it shut it down it went back and it said oh I'm set up for DHCP let me do my Dora again I'm going to reach out and find my DHCP server the, the original one I had and get my IP address back and I think VMware is causing it to pause for a second but that's what it's doing sometimes we take Wireshark a packet sniffer program and put it on the network so that you can actually see the, the broadcasts going back and forth to see what it's doing. I'm just going to say control C right here just to kill it and then do it again. There we go. So now if I say I have config, what do you know? I picked up my old IP address. That's because of the lease. So now here's the big question. Ping 192.168.254.1. I'm back in business again. Okay, so where is all this configured? Now, what's kind of a pain about where Red Hat puts it is it's kind of hidden. It's not really hidden, it's just deep in there. Where are your configuration files at? Etsy, yeah, I gave it away. All your configuration files are going to be in Etsy. Under Etsy, there's a directory called sysconfig. And under that, there's one called Network Scripts. And we'll look at that in just a second. But the one we're going to be interested in is called IFCFG ETH0. Interface configuration for the first Ethernet card. Let's look at this guy. CD Etsy Sysconfig Network Scripts. Looks like we've got a bunch of stuff in there. We've got IF down, IF up, lots of different scripts. 
but there's the one that we're actually interested in IFCFG ETH 0 so let's take a look and do a cat it's small IFCFG ETH 0 five lines can't beat that can you first one was a pound sign mean comment um, in Linux 99% of the time if you see a pound sign at the beginning of the line that's going to mean it's a comment and it's telling me that it's an AMD blah 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 some kind of network card thanks for that the device is ETH 0 on boot means yeah just as soon as the machine comes up turn on the network card boot proto DHCP that's my boot protocol what do you think my other option would be static would make sense but the truth of the matter is you could put chicken in there and it works for static and um, it looks for DHCP or something besides DHCP and just to be goofy I have put chicken in there and it does work then you have a hardware address and this actually is the hardware address of your card so let's monkey with this ETH0. What I'm going to do, we're going to leave in, see how it turned that blue, VIM turned my comment blue. I'm going to pound out my hardware address because sometimes with VMs, if something senses the same hardware address, it gets confused and it doesn't really need that. I'm going to switch this from boot protocol equals DHCP to static. Okay, if we're going to call it static, we're going to have to give it some information, aren't we? IP address equals 192.168.255.100. Net mask equals dot zero. Now, the big trick with this is it's IP ADDR, all in uppercase, net mask all in uppercase. Um, students sometimes forget and try to put IP address, which it doesn't recognize. But IP ADDR. You can actually do this too. Throw in the gateway right there. That works if you have multiple cards. We're going to learn a different way to do it. So I'm going to pound it out right now. Your DNS stuff goes somewhere else, and we'll look at that in just a second. Okay, so I changed that. If I do an IF config right now, will it reflect the new IP address? No. I just changed a file. So now if I do a service net network restart, it's actually going to read that file and bring back up my interface. Now if I do an IF config 255.100 and now whereas with DHCP if your lease runs out you could get another IP address at some time. I mean you could wind up with a different IP. With static it's always going to be the same. Um, kind of a, an analogy for that is with like I was on Bell South and with Bell South when you went with some of the cheaper plans you have a like a dynamic IP which means your IP address could change at any time but I wanted to set up a web server at my house so if you're going to set up a web server you have to have a static IP so I had to upgrade my service and get a static IP address so that my IP address never changes and at that point I could set myself to a a big funky name out on the internet so that now people can type it in and get to my network at home so that's a, a static IP address too alright ping piggin ping 192.168.254.1 I'm getting lucky today okay so we saw one way to set your default gateway. The other way, Etsy Sys 
config. If I'm not mistaken, I'm bluffing a little bit. We may get a chance to see grep here in a second. There's a file called networking. Network. Let's do a more of network. Networking, yes. IPv6, no. Um, networking, it's not in here, but I'm going to look anyway. Okay, somewhere there's a statement just like what I put in. Gateway equals something. How can I use grep to figure out which one of these files it's set in? Grep, there we go. Yeah, we'll throw that in there. Gateway is what I'm looking for, right? Star is going to represent. Tell you what, we'll just look in the local files. We won't even make it recursive right now. Wasn't in there. We'll make it recursive. Ooh. Now we're going to pop it to more to see if there's not just a. That's IF up. If gateway not equal, maybe they do expect to put it in there. I still think you can put it in that networking. There's a couple different ways to do it, depending on if you're multi-homed or not, depending on whether you have two network cards. Hey, there we go. No, that's what I put in. See, it found the one that I did. No. Nah. I have a PPP. Okay. That'll still set it. Let's do, how can you tell what your default gateway is? The command is a little bit funky. It's part of the route command. I'm going to do a route dash n. And since I didn't have a gateway set anywhere, I don't have a default gateway. Your default gateway, the way you can tell it's a default gateway is under this flags field. You've got a G right there. So I'm going to have to put my money where my mouth is. and pull that comment out and let's see if it sets my default gateway. Service network restart. I still think you could put the directive just gateway equals in that network thing and it work. I have config, IP address, subnet mask look good. Oops, it can't find that, route-n, but I do have my default gateway now, CG192.168.254.1. Destination, this is what's called a quad zero. A quad zero means anywhere. So if you're going to anywhere other than 192.168.254, then use this, and it's got the gateway flag. Service network restart. Do it again. There we go. I, I cheated. We're the. <laughs> we'll go over this in just a minute. What that means is look backward through your history and find the first command that starts off ser and execute it. And my last command that started ser was service network restart. When when you have geeks that are using a command prompt all the time, they find out ways to shortcut. And there's a lot of shortcuts built into to Linux. Okay, let's pop out for just a second and say, setting an IP address in IFCFG ETH zero. The statements were IPADDR equals 
192.168.254.100. Net mask equals not zero. And just to go ahead and give you a heads up, in this network, we're always going to use a 23-bit mask, which is 255, 255, 254. 23 bits being one bit less than the 24 that would be 255, 255, 255. Gateway equals 1. Then what do you have to do? Service, network, restart. So they're setting a an IP address. What one thing did I forget in there? It's hard to go back and edit with this. DNS server I don't have yet, but it doesn't go in here. Boot proto, let me make it a little bit bigger. Boot proto equals static. If you set all this stuff and leave your boot protocol to DHCP, it'll just ignore it. And it will set a, a, a DHCP address. Yeah, it keeps it in a configuration file. It doesn't change it, but it'll actually, the address you actually get will be DHCP. Um, on this network, yeah. The good thing about DHCP is, let's say you reconfigure your DNS for some reason and you say okay dot two fifty four dot um, ten isn't a DNS server anymore I'm going to use it for something else and I've got to change my DNS configuration now I'm going to use dot two fifty four dot nine and dot five and then here's this other third one if my machines were all set statically I would have to go around to every machine and sit down log in and change it You'd have to do that on your servers. With DHCP, you just change it at your DHCP server, and then, boom, the next time everybody logs in, they've got the new information. So that's that's um, a good bit easier. Um, okay, let's talk about DNS. Where do you set your DNS? Let's take a look. Your DNS, where do you think it would be set? What directory are we going to start at? Etsy. CD Etsy. You have a file that's called more resolve.conf. You're resolving names to IP addresses, right? So there we go. Let's take a look. This was generated by a, a local script. What it's looking for when you say search, that means if I type in NSLOOKUP. We'll talk about that in a second, where I'm trying to resolve a name to an address. If I say NSLOOKUP chicken, meaning I'm looking for the IP address of a machine named chicken on my local network, it's going to tack that onto the end. It's going to say, oh, he means chicken.la.alchemy.net, the local network. Here, that would probably be um, internal.nettechnet.org. So if I, say type, if I said NSLOOKUP ball20804, which would be like that machine right there, the search string would say, oh, he means the local network. Don't go out and look for it at CNN.com or someplace like that. That's not as important as the next two. These are just going to list your name servers. And that's the syntax that you use. Name server and then the IP address of the, the DNS server. So let's monkey with that for just a second. Let's say... setting your preferred DNS. Edit Etsy re... The odd thing about this is resolve is spelled R-E-S-O-L-V with no E at the end, which is a little odd. You don't even have to have the search command. You can just put name server 192.168.254. I think it's 10. I'm not really sure. Let's look and see. I 
ipconfig-all shows me that my DNS server is .10. I was right. And you can put in a second one in case your DNS server dies for some reason. So there's your syntax. Okay, let's uh, let's talk a little bit what I was mentioning just a second ago. You can actually use the host command, which is used more in, in Linux, but let's use nslookup because that works in DOS as well. If I say nslookup www.cnn.com, it's going to query my DNS server, and it should bring back what CNN's IP address is. For some reason, it is not. Let's try the old ping 192.168. Well, you can sort of see what the problem is, can't you? My name's sort of written listed in there. If it's dot ten, neither uh, ten fifteen, that's not going to work. So when I set it up as as DHCP, or I took it off of DHCP. Now my servers aren't right. When I did it with DHCP, it actually retrieved my um, my DNS. So this is some kind of default setting that's goofy. What happens when you don't have, when your DNS is not working? What does it look like? Where's my browser at? Application Firefox. So Firefox is starting. Here's your, your problem. Looking up www.centos.org. Right there's a dead giveaway that it can't find what it's doing. So it's, look, it's trying to resolve that centos.org into an IP address. So even in Windows, if you see that it's looking up something, that means it's trying DNS and it can't find it. It's not that it can't contact it. It's just trying to find the name. So let's see if we can fix it. I'm going to say vim etsy resolve.conf and I'm going to just pound that out and I'm going to change my, I'm going to take that one out because we've only got one name server on this network and I'm going to put in 192.168.254.10 there's my name server so now I may have to restart Firefox if I type in www.cnn.com, let's see if it can find it. There we go. Looking up, waiting for, boom. Now it works. How would it have been different if uh, if the DNS can work? Some, the DNS will cache um, stuff, right? So if it had been a bad connection, um, config eth0. left out net mask. So now I have a IP address that doesn't make any sense. Let's see what it does when I say refresh. So it's able to look it up, but it can't establish a connection. So the kind of error that it kicks back can can sh uh, can show you what's wrong. Service network restart and that should bring back my static configuration we'll do a more of etsy resolve.conf and it's not been messed with so we should be able to do something like ns look up www.cnn.com now and there we go does it make sense that CNN.com would have more than one IP address? Yeah, it's big. abtech.edu google.com Yeah. So, DNS works. Okay, we got any questions about any of the stuff we've covered?